have a little experiment for you to do, a little test, a little thing. We're just going to see if you can do it. Uh, it's not hard. It doesn't require you to stand up or anything. It just requires a thumb and a pointer finger and both hands. So it's not difficult, again, but you may find it challenging. What I want you to do is put your right thumb up, point your other finger on the other hand. The, the pointer finger on your left hand points out. So you got a right thumb, a left finger pointing. Everybody got that? Now switch. Your left thumb's up, your right finger's pointing. Now switch again. Switch again. Keep switching. How fast can you go? How long would it take you to learn how to do this so that you could do it quickly? What do you think? Five minutes? Ten minutes? A day? A lifetime? <laughs> Never. <laughs> Was that awkward? Did you feel silly? Did you think, my neighbor can do it and I can't? <laughs> Awkward is a barrier and a blessing. Awkward says, I don't want to learn that. I'll look silly. I don't want to do that. And it's not just this. this is, it's everything in life, right? Everything. Awkward is the beginning of learning. If you don't accept awkward, you will not learn. At the same, when does the most growth happen? In awkwardness, right? Think about this also. <clears throat> you cook a new meal that you've never cooked before. Nobody in your house has tasted it. It's a whole brand new thing. It's like nothing ever done before. And they go, wow, this is amazing. Thank you for making this. This took so much time. This is so good. You get a compliment, why? Because it's different. It tastes good, it's unique, it's new. Now, go back and cook the thing that you've always cooked. Everybody knows it. It's the steady, the regular, it's the pot roast or the hamburger, whatever it is that you make at home. Maybe it's meatloaf, I don't know. But when you make it the first time, people go, that's good. After 20 times, yeah, it's all right. Not a big deal. And after a lifetime of cooking, how many of you go, thank you so much for cooking. That was amazing. Now, what about when you first heard a certain preacher and you went, wow, that was good. I've never heard anything like that. After you've heard him about 20 times, it's like, well, you know. But then when they try something different, you go, oh, that was so good, right? And here's the thing. You have to be willing to risk awkward or you will receive fewer and fewer compliments because as it's said, you will be taken for granted, right? Is it being taken for granted or is it because you are faithful and you work hard and people know your skill level and you perform at skill level and it's not like you're taken for granted like ah, you don't care about me you don't you never compliment it's not that it's you've performed according to standard and it's good and nobody's complaining and at some point you get to that stage in life where you go nobody's complaining I'm doing okay <laughs> right but then you think, but I'd like to have a compliment. So you have to work harder, right? You have to pick it up, and people have to notice. <clears throat> so this morning we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. Two simple little parables, not terribly big, not terribly amazing. You know, they're pretty good. They're, they're just, you know, they're all right. They're nothing like the parables we talked about before. 
You can imagine Jesus, you know, telling some new parables, different parables, challenging parables, but, but these are kind of standard. The kingdom of heaven, right? We got a pearl of great price, and we got treasure in a field. All right, so that's the sermon title for today, and this is the sermon series, Hiding in Plain Sight. All the things that you thought you knew, but maybe, maybe they aren't exactly what you know. Maybe there's something different going on. And, and maybe another thought here is for you to learn this, where we go here, yeah, there we go. For you to learn that, do you know what has to happen in your brain? New synapses have to fire. New connections have to be made. For you to grow in any meaningful, appreciable way, you have to do it different. You have to think different. You have to experience different. Something has to change around you or within you. And for it to stick, it's going to be a little painful. I remember, <clears throat> I remember when we started studying Chinese in China as a missionary. And I remember at first, my brain hurt. I came home and my head was just so worn out. My, my, like, I was just tired. And it was because I was thinking in a whole other language for like four hours. And it, it wasn't easy. It was overwhelming. Now, after four or five years of that, it got pretty easy. And my head would be a little cloudy. But I became accustomed to it. Right? And it's the same for lifting weights. If you first start to lift or exercise, you're like, oh, I'm sore. But after a bit, you get used to that. And the soreness isn't the same soreness, right? And as you adjust to anything in life, you become comfortable with it. But I think Jesus wants to shake you out of that comfort just a little bit and say, hey, think again, look again, try again. So let's pray. God, open our hearts that we might hear you. Open our eyes that we might see you. Let us hear, listen, and obey. Let us know what it means to be your children. At the same, God, may, may you speak clearly through me to all of us, including me. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. So, as we get started down this path, we're going to start in Genesis. And we're going to just take a little stroll through this idea of kingdom. Okay? So, Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he made everything. Right? And that's, that's pretty much chapter 1. Verse 28, though, he says to humanity, when he made man and woman, he said, You will now rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and the animals on the land, and all the plants... But that rule over, that idea of being a ruler, is that to dominate? Is that to take authority and say, I'm the boss, you listen to me? <laughs> it's, it's not what we see. That is not the healthy perspective of a kingdom thinker. It is actually to shape and mold the world in a way that it can flourish. And to help all the creatures, big and small, including us, to flourish, to grow, to thrive. So not allowing anything to dominate, but instead allowing everything to grow, to flourish. And we were called to make it all into a garden. You'll remember there was a garden. The whole world wasn't a garden because there was an outside of that garden. And the kingdom of God was essentially in the garden. And we were made in the image of God to be his image bearers to the world. And everybody should look at us, all of the humans, and go, that's what God looks like. Right? And that's how God behaves. But then we didn't behave that way. And then in some ways we lost that look. Right? We lost that generous, kind spirit. And we thought more of ourselves and we took. We said, I want that, and we took. And every time you hear that verb took in Genesis and throughout most of the Bible, it's generally negative. Taking 
is not kingdom oriented. So, but the next thing that happens that's really, really big is the Exodus. And in an extra, Exodus chapter 15, verse 18, it says, In the song, and the Lord reigns forever and ever. And it's the first time that we hear God as king. And it's not direct. It's Yahweh, the Lord, the creator God, reigns forever and ever. Oh, you reign as a king. And here's these people brought out of slavery and saying, but we still have a king. And this is our king who set us free from real, actual slavery where it was not not good at all. So then we go into the prophets and we hear Isaiah say, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And you can think about those feet for just a minute. I mean, back in the day they wore sandals. How many of you wear sandals and your feet stay pretty without any work whatsoever? They don't stay pretty, do they? unless you work on them, because they get calluses, and then they crack, and they get blisters, and, they get, and, and then you, if, if you walked every day in sandals everywhere you went, you'd probably have some cuts and scrapes and scratches on your feet, wouldn't they? And how beautiful are those feet? Well, they're beautiful because they bring the message of the kingdom, the good news, and the good news is that God is king, and that God wants to set you free from all the garbage, you only need to accept his freedom as a gift and then live in line with him, right? Then we find <clears throat> Jesus. In Matthew 4, 17, he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he speaks of the kingdom. And he encourages you to consider again that maybe we didn't get it right. And you say, hold on, no, no, no. Jesus, well, hold on, let me think about that. Did, what, what did we get, huh? Now, here again, immediately after 4.17 is 4.18 through 4.22, where he goes along and he says, hey, you, follow me. Hey, you, follow me. And what happens? He calls 12. And when he calls them, they give up everything and they follow him. They give up everything and they fo follow him. Why? Because he has good news and they know it. How do they know it? I, I don't really understand. But everybody's turning to Jesus and going, he's got it, whatever he's got, I want some, I'm with him. Whatever he's doing, I'm doing, I'm, 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 I'm there, right? And the next thing you see is the good news of the kingdom being taught. He's going around, we, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, we say it's the heart of scripture, it's the heart of what it means to be a Christian. How many of you have memorized that and can just quote it right off? How many of you have, have given your heart to that in a way that you've studied it thoroughly and that you know it well and that you love it and that you can quote from it? How many of you have, have really just, this is the kingdom, I need this? Hmm. And, and so the good news of the kingdom is being taught. And then in Matthew 8 through 9, the kingdom is revealed. And it's showing up. And how's it showing up? Just after all these teachings, what happens? Jesus goes and heals people. Like blind see, lame walk, dead rise. I mean, demons are, are sent off. People are released from bondage. Again, slavery of a different sort, but they are released. And you think, wow, this is the kingdom. I want to be a part of that. But now let's step back into the disciples' shoes for a minute. <clears throat> How many of them understood half of it at this stage in the story? How many of them were like, we got Jesus, we've got it all figured out, and, and we're ready to die for him? And how many of them were more like, uh, Jesus, can you tell me that parable again? <laughs> Jesus, why do you keep saying you're going to die? You're not going to die. That's not happening to you. <clears throat> and, and Jesus... <laughs> I thought you are coming to king. You're, you're the king. You, you know the Christ, the Messiah, means the anointed one. And, and more specifically, in the kingdom of God, it means the king. But they're looking at Jesus as an earthly king, a ruler that will, will take over, defeat Rome, and put them on top, and cause them to be the victors and the power brokers and the ones who tell all the nations how to behave and what to do and where to go and, 
And, and when we say jump, you say how high. Like, that's not, that's not, that's not how it's supposed to work. And so Jesus has already taught a couple parables that we've talked about. What growth looks like. What the kingdom looks like, in fact. We, we talked about uh, all, all those kinds of things. We talked it, he, he taught in parables because he was trying to confuse the crowd, it would seem. He was not trying to tell them too directly what was going on because in public, he can't declare things so clearly because he knows he'll die. Because everything he's saying is everything the emperor claims for himself. The same titles apply to Jesus and the emperor. The son of God, the son of man. All of those are are messianic titles that the emperor claims. And so... We get to the kingdom of heaven here, and, and the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Not complicated, is it? But then again, in your own life, <laughs> have you given it all up? Have you sold everything? Have you found the treasure? Did you chase after it? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went its way and sold everything he had and bought it. And my question is, what is he doing with the one pearl? <laughs> is he going to put it on display and charge, charge admission? <laughs> What's he doing with the one pearl? Is he going to set it up in some new... I don't know. I mean, is it, how big is it? And, and what, what, what's he doing with it? He sold everything else so he could get that one thing. And now what's he doing with it? How is he going to live? How is he going to eat? Like, where, where's his life going? It doesn't make sense to me. I've got to be honest. But again, it's not talking about your average merchant. And it's not talking about pearls, really. Throughout the Old Testament, in, in Proverbs, and in Psalms especially, both of those places talk about the wealth of the kingdom. That, that following God, hearing God, knowing the wisdom of God is more valuable than rubies. More valuable than all the gold. More valuable than anything. And yet we have to ask the question, what if we sold? What have we given up? Is our life really different? I mean, how how different do we live? Do we know? Do do we know God? Are Are we really like connected and close and like emotionally in love with, you might even say? And, and would we walk away from everything to follow Jesus, really? Or would we need to set up a trust and put somebody in charge of it and make sure that, you know, in case it didn't work out, we'd have a backup plan? <laughs> And, and, you know, to be wise, to be smart, and to recognize, I can't sell everything. Like, I gotta, I gotta live. Like, that was my struggle as a child. All of this was so, ugh. And then, you remember that we talked about it in class. The rich young guy that came up that was really wealthy and said, Jesus, you're the best. I'll do whatever you say. I want to follow you. And Jesus said, well, <laughs> Go sell everything and uh, give it to the poor and then come follow me. And he went away sad and we're all like, that's right, because he didn't give it all up. And we're like, but I'm keeping mine. <laughs> At the same, let's, let's be honest and let's deal truthfully with, with all of this. Is being rich wrong? Is having things evil? No. Who supported Jesus throughout his whole ministry? 
a bunch of women. Go, go read the New Testament again, especially the Gospels, and pay attention. Women, a, a group of them, followed him everywhere, and it was out of their wealth that they supported him financially. He didn't tell them to sell everything. <laughs> there, there has to be some wisdom in that, right? And at the same, you, you follow Jesus your whole life. The question is, is everything you have his or is it yours? Now you would say his. How does that show up in real day-to-day -day living? I can't answer that. At, at the same, you know, some would say if they were really old school, <clears throat> you know, I give my tenth to the church, my tithe, I give that, and then God lets me have and enjoy the rest all for me, whatever I want, and that's good, and I like the deal, and I'm done. <laughs> but some would say, hey, I drop a little in the collection. I'm not giving a tenth. That's a little outrageous. Like, that's way too much. Jesus said you should give all. <laughs> uh, uh. And so the tenth only represents the idea that it's actually all his. That's the a, that's a idea behind the tenth, is that you would say, no, no, no. <laughs> this is just the beginning. Everything I have is God's, and if needed, yes, I'll gladly give it all up. So, faith challenges, because I'm not finishing that sermon like that, but, but it's mostly done. <clears throat> but faith challenges are where we try to apply it. If you're new here or haven't been for a while, this is, again, the idea of how do we get this into our lives and really and truly, like, try to live it out? <clears throat> it's pretty simple. Kingdoms have kings. <laughs> right? The kingdom of heaven, who's the king? Jesus. He's always the king. He has to be the king. Difficulty is, how many of us don't really do what we know to be true? There's some part of us that still holds on to ideas, ways of living, attitudes that are not kingdom attitudes. They're not kingdom ways of behaving. They are not really kingdom and we struggle to allow the king, Jesus, to be the king. And when we say, no, 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 I'll give it all. Is that? And yet we say, but no, I don't have to do that. You can't ask me to do that. I'm too busy. I've got all these other things. No, no, that would be awkward. That makes me uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. I don't want to talk to my neighbor. No, I'm, I'm not going to go and, and, you know, help the homeless. And, and no, I'm not going to go and, you know, take care of the person that I feel Jesus prompting me to go take care of or do for. And, and no, I'm not giving up the grudge. And no, I'm not giving up the mm, anger in my heart. No, I'm not giving up all the things I'm... I'm still human, you know. <laughs> Let's go back to the garden for a minute. Did they have a house, Adam and Eve? Did they have clothing? What did they have? They had God. And God provided everything. If you could go to the garden... Would you give it all up? If you could get back to the garden, granted, being naked today would be a little awkward, but if everybody else was doing it and God said it was okay and your eyes were not full of darkness where you had to look at all the things you're not supposed to look at, let's imagine that our bodies would radiate the glory of God because we were innocent and holy, completely without sin, and we shone like Jesus, Moses, and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Let's imagine 
that you could step back into that, would you do it? In a heartbeat. Not even a doubt. Not even a question. I would gladly become whatever God wanted me to become so that I could have that life that is absolutely the best life. Because I would walk and talk with God and I would have no strife with anyone. That is the offer. That is the offer of King Jesus. That you would not remove your clothing, but that you would remove the mask that this clothing has become in some sense. We made fig leaves, right? We being Adam and Eve. But what we've done today is kind of just move those up to our faces. And we hide behind. I, oh, you don't need to know that. I'm not telling you anything. And we hide behind. You, you don't need to know my finances. And we hide behind. You don't need to know why I'm angry with my neighbor. And we hide behind. I have rights and I have privileges and I have freedoms. And this is America and you can't tell me what to do. And when King Jesus shows up and says, would you just lay all that down, please? Would you just give all of it up? Would you set it aside? Would you open your heart and, and trust that, that I'm not going to like leave you wounded? That you need to be emotionally, spiritually naked and vulnerable to at least one person in the world? Maybe two or three and definitely to God because he already sees it all. And when you do that and live in such a way that you are no longer wrapped up in keeping up some appearance, what happens? Do you not live in some sense of new heaven, new earth? Do you not move into a place where you're not wrapped up in trying to keep everything just so? But now you're going, hang on, this is awkward, but you know what, I've learned it. I can, I can do this. <laughs> this right here, this silly little trick, once I tried it and kept trying it, it took about 5, 10 minutes, 15, 20, and I was like, this is easy. The hard part is, in our hearts and in our brains, we have worn paths that are so deep, so entrenched, so wrapped up in, I have rights, you can't tell me what to do, that when King Jesus comes along and says, would you lay it down, please? I love you. I am for you. I'm trying to show you how to live in a way that is not that, but that is moving into the kingdom of heaven, where you don't earn it, all the verbs of salvation are centered on God. He gives. He blesses. Your part is not an amazing wow. It's a I receive, I accept, I enter. But not look at what I've done. And a part of that is the humility to say, I need I am in a deficit, I am in a hole, and I recognize the pain that I've caused myself and others. And when he says, will you sell it all? I, I think, I think he means it. Will you give up all the junk and accept the kingdom? And it's, it's not... <laughs> It's not money. It's not your house. Those are just examples. Those are just little items that show whether or not you are a part of the kingdom because you use them in ways that your neighbors don't. Everything you have is his and it will show up because you're not begrudgingly sharing but you're willingly blessing. You're not I gave my 20 at the, at the plate, or I, I, I did what I, was, what I had to do. I'm doing the minimum. Instead, your question becomes, how can I do more? 
How can I love more? How can I show more? I remember as a child, the question was, how much can I do and still get into the kingdom? Like, what is the unacceptable line that I cannot cross? And what's the minimum that's required of me to show up and like, you know, be a part of the church? But those are the wrong questions, whether it's in dating or in life. The question is not what's the minimum, what's the least. The question is, how can I do more? How can I, how can I love more? How can I give more? How can I honor, respect, show God's love for me more to the people around me? When we live that way, <clears throat> we recognize King Jesus, period. And the hard part is this. It is awkward. At first. But eventually, guess what happens? It becomes normal for you and awkward for everybody else. <laughs> And that awkward for them highlights the difference that King Jesus is making in and through your life. And if you will live that way, then you go, oh yeah, I'm a fool for Christ. Everybody looks at me and thinks I'm silly and foolish and stupid. But actually, I live without worries. I live without anxieties. I live without constant Fear of somebody taking advantage, manipulating, abusing me. Because I know who I am and whose I am and that I am rich beyond compare. And all of that stuff is minor. Because my identity is in Christ, in the King, in Jesus. And that sets me free. Let's pray as Jesus has taught us to. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Father, as we continue to pray, we ask that you would see our hearts, see our hands, our feet, that we would be your people. That we would do the awkward thing and learn and grow. And that we would allow others to experience an awkwardness in our presence because we're still learning, still growing. And we humble ourselves before you and before others and we say, there is but one king, his name is Jesus. And it's his kingdom that we want, not our own. And it's his will that we desire, not our own. And we continue to learn, continue to grow, and we continue to struggle. And we say, God, may your will be done, not mine. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.